what you want, when you want it, where you want it. This is The Mesh. Foot Candle Films. Film news and reviews from two guys who really like movies. This episode is brought to you by the Foot Candle Film Society. For a schedule of upcoming screenings and membership information, visit the Society's website at www.footcandle.org. Hello and welcome to Foot Candle Films here on TheMesh.TV. My name is Alan. With me always is Chris. We Hello are everyone. Together we are co-directors of the Foot Candle Film Society and the Foot Candle Film Festival. And today we're serving as co-host of Foot Candle Films Podcast. See so how it all fits together. It all kind of fits together. There's a rhyme and a reason to it all. So welcome. Thanks for listening to the show today. Uh, this is our, our, our podcast where every time we get together, we have at least a couple of films to discuss and review. Today being no exception, we have two films to review here as well, followed by some of our uh, news items where we like to share some news going on in the film community with one another and see if we have some reactions or thoughts to it. And then we go into our recommendations of the episode. That's where Chris and I both present a film that we think is worth maybe revisiting or checking out or searching out for online. If you're so inclined to look for something, maybe going into the weekend, you're looking for a film to catch up on. We want to provide you with some recommendations you may enjoy. So Chris, today's show, we have two films to discuss. The first will be the latest film starring Glenn Close, who is nominated for Best Actress in this film. It is the film The Wife. Then we'll be moving on to a uh, discussion about the Japanese film that's also nominated for an Academy Award, Best Foreign Film. It is the film Shoplifters from the director Hirokazu Kurita. Then we'll do our news and the recommendations. So that's kind of our plan for the show. Are you ready to get started? Yes, let's do it. All right, well, let's move on to our first review, which is the film The Wife. Hello. Am I speaking to Mr. Castle? It is my great honor to tell you, Mr. Castleman, that you have been chosen to receive the Nobel Prize in Literature. <laughs> Don't ever think that you can get their approval. Who's? The men. I would like to convey to you the warm congratulations of the Swedish Academy. You have reinvented the very nature of storytelling. Tell me about yourself. Do you have an occupation? I do. And what is that? I am a kingmaker. The Wife, which is a film by Bjorn Rung, which I think is his first English film. He's mm-hmm. made some other films, but I think this is his first film that he did in English. Uh, stars Glenn Close as The Wife, who is kind of questioning her life choices as she goes to Stockholm with her husband, who is a big deal writer. And the reason they're going to Stockholm is because he has been given the uh, Nobel Prize for Literature. And it kind of follows the couple as they go to various events and, you know, the drama that kind of plays out between them and their son as well accompanies them on this trip. Alan uh, Glenn Close has been nominated for an Oscar for uh, her performance in this, and you know you've got another big acting in big acting person personality in Jonathan Price who's been in lots of films, very recognizable. Mm-hmm. Uh, the two of them working together as the husband and wife. What what was your uh, take on the film, and can you see why she got nominated for her uh, performance? Um, so mixed answers on that. Um, how, what did I think of the film? I thought the film was, it was a, I I enjoyed it. I thought it was good. It's a fairly simple film. Um, it's, I know it's based off of a novel and I would assume it's a pretty fair adaptation of that novel. And you know, the story itself is an intriguing story. It's not a terribly complicated story, but I think it does play out well on screen. Um, we do follow these two characters, this married couple and starting from point a, it's a, it, it seems to be a very strong, healthy relationship, but then you start to learn a little bit more as you go along. And the director, I think does a pretty good job of cluing us in along the way when there are some moments that are going to be a little more revealing about the kind of relationship they actually have and what it means for the course of the story we're in. Is it Glenn Close? You know, is it deserving of the best actress? She's really good in this, but I don't know if it quite reaches that level. Um, it's it's more of I think you know the thing that works for this film is more just the story and the writing itself. I, I don't think any of the performances were over the the moon great. 
I wonder with going close if it's just, you know, she's been nominated, I think, five or six times and never won for Best Actress. Right. It's a pretty competitive field in the actress field right now, but she's in there and I think uh, it, it's a good performance. It's a, it's a fine performance, but it's probably not one of her best in my opinion. Um, but if you are a Glenn Close fan, I think you find some things you like out of it. She has a couple of moments where she really gets to play with the role, but most of the time it's a pretty reserved role throughout the film. I I, I thought the movie was, was good. I, I liked it. Uh, you know, um, not a lot deeper to it to talk about. I mean, that's one thing I will say. It's just, you know, we're used to seeing a lot of films where there's a lot kind of deeper meanings and symbolism and other things going on. There really wasn't that. This is a pretty straightforward, simple adaptation of a novel with a fairly uh, straightforward story. Uh, we do have some interesting supporting parts. Uh, Christian Slater, who, you know, it's always interesting to see him back him in, in a movie. While, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, playing as Nathaniel Bone, who's a, a biographer who's been working on trying to get a biography of Joe Castleman, who's played by Jonathan Price, the, the, the husband in the relationship. Uh, so that's nice. And then Elizabeth McGovern is also someone I think last time I've seen her was on Downton Abbey TV show, but she plays a, a fellow female writer in the film. And uh, at least in a couple of flashback scenes, we do have some flashbacks in the film, which I think were, were handled pretty well. It's always tough when you're trying to cast actors that can, can portray someone well-known uh, earlier stage in their life. But I think the characters, the, the, the actors they got in those roles did a pretty good job with it. So, Chris, your thoughts. I mean, I'm, I'm fairly positive on it. I thought it was a fine film. Uh, I don't really have too much to gripe about, but I'm also, you know, I think it's, it's a fairly slight film, but I think uh, it worked for me okay. So Yeah, I, I, going into the film, I'd heard a lot about Glenn Close's performance. Obviously, the nomination had come out when you and I got, got around to seeing it. And I can see why she's nominated because just like per usual, you know, she's good in things and she's good in this. But it was distracting for me. Um, the, I thought the script was kind of terrible. Mm. And um, the idea was an interesting one to explore the kind of the wife behind the writer. You have this famous person and then you have the person that helps support him and helps him do things. And some of the territory they start exploring was being done in an interesting way. But just the way it was handled through direction slash script I thought was kind of clumsy. Hmm. The flashbacks reveal what they needed to do, but um, (laughs) the way, just kind of the way it was done, it was like, it's kind of hard. I don't want to spoil anything from the Mm -hmm. film because there is kind of a, a revelation that comes Mm -hmm. about, but the way that revelation was handled was so clumsily done. I felt like within the first 10 or 15 minutes of the film, I kind of knew, you know, I kind of knew where it was going, what was going to happen. Interesting. And it wasn't, and because of that, it wasn't really interesting. The dialogue didn't really crackle for me. The scenes weren't edited very well. And the film is an hour and 40 minutes. So you kind of feel like you know what's going on in the first 10 minutes. Other than Glenn Close's performance, I was kind of bored for the rest of the hour and 30 minutes of the running time. Um, There is, and like, I can't even tell you scenes that I liked because I thought Mm. they all kind of hit the same note over and over again, kind of gave you the same idea of the wife's role over and over and over again. Hmm. And nothing really dynamically changed for me. It was kind of repetitive. There is a scene you mentioned Christian Slater. I got excited when he popped up. He has a conversation with her, Mm -hmm. with Glenn Close, the the wife, Miss Castleman in a bar. Mm -hmm. And that scene was good I think despite some of the pacing and despite some of the editing, but I think it's because you had Christian Slater who was playing really well off and close. And, you know, he's this younger kind of guy who's trying to do a biography on the husband and she kind of knows his game. And I know they kind of play a cat and mouse back and Mm -hmm. forth. And that part worked for me, but it was disappointing because I felt like in the hands of a different director or edited differently, it could have really crackled or could have really Hmm. could have really worked but instead it it worked but it just kind of left me wishing that was handled better and that was my probably favorite scene in the film i thought that was where we definitely had the most intrigue and and kind of more excitement going on within a dialogue scene Uh, i'll give you that i think that was probably the strongest scene in the film and could have been stronger but 
I don't know. I, uh, I, I, I walked away with a little better impression of the film, obviously. I, I thought it was fine. I, I didn't encounter a lot of the same concerns about the script you did. Um, but I see where you're coming and from. And the way this, the character of the son was handled just seemed, again, I guess kind of telegraphed a little. The son, the son subplot or, or plot line, yeah. I was actually going to say that was one of my weaknesses in the film. I don't think that element worked. I know what they were trying to do and maybe it worked out better in the book or was had a better, better impact, but it was that part. I, I will give you, I thought was clumsy in the film, how his interactions with the two parents kind of uh, learning more about where he is in life and what's happened going on with him was not handled very, very gracefully. I think so. the thing is uh, to boil it down is like, I feel like I've seen this type story or this type, kind of material explored before, um, we had a really good performance with Glenn Close, but otherwise the film just kind of laid there. Nothing was really happening. And I think, you know, some stylistic choices could have helped or, you know, maybe the fact that this is the first English language film for this director. So it was kind of hard maybe to work with, I, you know, maybe there's something there that kind of hindered it. I'm not, I'm not really sure. Mm. Um, but there's a, there's also something that happens in the end of the film without ruining anything there because I don't want to spoil anything, but there's a decision the wife makes in the closing moments of the film that could have really been interesting, but instead it was just kind of, I don't know, they're it just kind of left there and it closes out. She kind of mentions some things to her son. So it's a little bit of a tacked on type of a right. real simple way and, of bringing it in. And like, you know, the, we mentioned, you said it was a highlight of yours, the Christian Slater conversation with Glenn Close. Okay, Christian Slater conversation in bar with son just felt like mm. shoehorned in, not really well done, dot, just oddly acted, just didn't really work. Maybe there's some things on the cutting room floor, too, that could have added something, but it just, I don't know, it just didn't flow very well oh. for me at all. all right. Well, I, I had a better time with it. I, I didn't have a lot of the same script and pacing issues and, and all that you did, but I mean... Again, I, I I feel like it worked together fine as a film. But again, it was a very slight film. Uh, it's a film that, you know, it doesn't really linger with you too long afterwards. Uh, the fact that we saw it two weeks ago, and I think we're kind of both struggling to kind of remember things <laughs> from it. You know, sure. does say that maybe it just didn't make the huge impact as far as a film going experience. But keeping in mind that Glenn Close is the only thing that's nominated from this film for her performance. So right. it is one of those, we have those kind of films pop into the Oscars every once in a while where the film, the one singular nomination it gets is for one of the performances because the rest of the film just doesn't quite live up to that, that level of, uh, of quality. Sure. Uh, but overall, I, I found it to be a fine film. I found it to be a, a fine film. I found it to be <laughs> a, a acceptable film. Uh, you know, if we get to see a film that, uh, I'll just put this out there. Put, seeing a film with headlining uh, older actors, uh, more in a in a non sequel, non it was an uh, original piece of material. a very original, sure. granted, based on a book, but still, right. It's nice to see something a little different than I think we get exposed to in the multiplexes so much. You know, uh, portrayed for us. I I may have elevated a little bit in my head just because I like seeing something a little different than what I think we get exposed to a lot in, in, in cinema, especially in this review process. So, um, yeah, that's the wife. Anything, any other feedback, any other thoughts to say on that? No. Um, you know, if I, I guess I would basically say, skip it unless you're interested for some reason to see Glenn Close's performance. Um, but you know, she, she's a great actress and she's been in a lot of other things where she's a lot able to be a lot better and in more interesting films. So I guess if you're an Oscar completist, seek this film out. Otherwise I would, I would skip it. Well, and I'll counter that by saying, I, I do think there's probably some good audiences for this film and you may enjoy it. Uh, it, it's, I think it's a fairly, despite any script issues that Chris may have identified, I think the story itself is an interesting story and one that, you know, maybe it worked well better in a book than it did in the film I version, it did. <laughs> but I uh, I think the story is interesting, and I think Glenn Close and I think Jonathan Price are both pretty good in it. So I, I think it's worth checking out. We're going to split just a little bit on that. I think it's okay. I think it's worth, <laughs> worth <laughs> yeah, Graham, Agreed, not, and not exactly coming down and like beaming uh, mounds of praise on this film, but I do feel like it's a solid, uh, good film that's worth checking out if you're so inclined. So it's all your decision whether you listen to Chris or whether you listen <laughs> to me. And either way, 
it's fine. We appreciate you listening regardless. So <laughs> so with that, that is The Wife. Uh, it is available online. That's, as far as last time I checked a little bit ago, Alicia. available on Amazon and iTunes and all those places. So if you would like to follow my lead and give it a shot, then I do recommend you check it out. If you want to follow Chris's lead, eh, you know, just save yourself the 3 or $4 rental and move on to something else. Okay. So that's The Wife. Let's move on to our second review, though, which is the film uh, Shoplifters, Japanese film. Uh, one of the one five films are running for best foreign film, uh, directed by Hirokazu Kurita. <laughs> Chris, with shoplifters, we have a tale of a family. Uh, basically, most all of them small town crooks, okay. in some way, shape, or form. Uh, they're shoplifters. We actually—that's the very first moment we get to see them as they're in the process. At least two of the four or five family members are shoplifting a grocery store, and we come to find out that is a, a good bit of how they get by how they make their living outside of the jobs they hold as well during the course of one of these uh, shoplifting events they end up taking in a child that they find outside in the cold and that leads to a development within the family some changes and ultimately some things that you learn about this family as the film goes along Chris, this is a Japanese film, so obviously it was subtitled uh, for us as we're as we're watching that I'm always curious with films that are subtitled you know if you think about it when you're watching a film like this and you have subtitles, you're spending so much time eyes darting down to the words on the screen right. as a way and away from the faces and the people and actually what's on the screen. My question to you is, do you feel like, uh, do you feel like this, this film still got you bought into this family as characters Despite the fact that our eyes are kind of moving away from their faces, away from their, their, their physical forms on the screen to read a lot of their text, because there's a lot of dialogue, there's a lot of conversation to follow. Sure. In other words, do you feel like the film still allows you to connect with this family and how successful was it doing it? Because I think that really hinges on your enjoyment of the film is how much you connect with this family and are willing to go along with them on the ride for the next two hours of this film. Sure. I, I think... I liked this film. Um, however, if you are one that does not enjoy foreign films, or subtitled films, yeah, I, this is your worst nightmare because it's a chore. Yeah. there's so much of the subtitle things, like little nuances, and you don't get to look at the faces because you are looking at the dialogue. And I admit, for the first 20 or 30 minutes, I was kind of lost mm -hmm. because it is a family, but it is not your typical family. You can tell people come from different areas and they're loosely knit they're basically like a group as opposed to a family. They're, you know, there's, they're basically, they've kind of a ragtag band that mm -hmm. comes together and they call themselves a family. I had trouble tacking, tracking down like, wait, what is this person's name? Oh, this is the, okay. Got to do air quotes here. The dad of the family, but what's his name? Is that his name? No, this, that's the other kid's name. The young boy who is, yeah. you know, and it was kind of like, it was, it was distracting for me because I was trying to like associate names with faces but i was always reading the name then jumping back up to see who you know it's kind of mm -hmm. like okay who, who who's being talked about here um so that that was distracting but it is a strength of the film that despite that i was still able to stay with it and it you know it has a running time of two hours and it's not you know it's not like they're there are scenes of shoplifting, but it's not like they're bank heists. No. And there's a lot of kind of day-to-day -day cooking meals, talking to one another, walking in a park. Um, there's, there's just very kind of very slow-paced activities of daily life. Kind of you could almost see it as kind of a documentary of some um, marginalized people in Japan. So it, it does, it's not brisk. <laughs> you know, there's mm -hmm. not a lot of things happening. So that could also maybe take some people out of the film – and I will say, overall for me, for the film, I, I thought it was okay. You know, some of the imagery and the cinematography was good. Some of the acting, when I wasn't reading the lines down at the bottom of the screen, I could tell that these people were, you know, good actors. Um, but 
I really kind of got one over to the film in the last, oh, let's say 15 or 20 minutes. So I'd have to mm-hmm. go back and watch it again. But some something big kind of happens. And then all of a sudden, it was like maybe the snowball was rolling down the hill the whole movie, but it was rolling very slowly. <laughs> and then all of a yeah. sudden, the avalanche hits and all these things come to light true relationships in between the family members and kind of like what the living conditions really were are kind of revealed. And it's not like a twist because things are kind of laid out there for you. And I don't know, maybe it's more obvious if you are a native Japanese speaker, and you're not having to read subtitles. Maybe you kind of pick up on some more things Mm -hmm. more than I did. Um, But it just really kind of hit me and you're like, whoa, 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 wait, what? And you kind of want to pause and rewind the movie and be like, oh, okay, that's what, but you know, so much hits you very rapid fire that it, I mean, it's not like the ending of like a usual suspects or anything, but it's kind of in a way close (laughs) and you was not expecting that at all. Yeah. Um, So that's one thing that I think if you are somebody who wants to give it a chance and you're frustrated within the first half hour or within the first hour I think if you watch it to the end, you may be like, oh, it kind of, to me, it was rewarding me for having patience because there were these, I don't want to say twists, but revelation there again, revelations yeah. that kind of took place that really made it worthwhile for me. So what was your take? No, I, I'm with you on this. I like this film too. Um, I agree with you that the film is a little uh, slower and, and maybe tougher to kind of grasp in that first hour and a half. My concern, though, the ending, yes, the ending made the film a different type of film than maybe I expected or 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 it helped you reframe the whole movie you just saw before you Correct. in a much better way. I, I wish the ending was stronger for me. It was interesting and it was definitely made me reframe the film again and think back to the previous film. But I also feel like the ending there were a lot of stumbles and how they, they rolled this information out and how they shared this. That was just a little disappointing to me. There's a couple of characters we lose in that ending bit that I wish hmm. we kind of followed up on. There's a couple of uh, moments of we're, we're learning things and I'm not saying I need it spelled out for me, but I do think there could have been a little more payoff in some of the things we learned. And that said, uh, was, I wasn't looking for a pat wrapped up ending, but I do feel like there were some loose threads that just didn't get addressed in that last 20 minutes that were a little disappointing. Um, yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying. Mm. Um, but for me, it was a very rewarding way to finish up the film. Cause there again, mm. <laughs> like it was saying, good job, Chris, you were patient with the first <laughs> Congratulations. hour. You Congratulations. You sat with us for an hour and a half. Now you get the fun were, yeah. ending here in the last right, 20 and minutes. I think, yeah. When you hear kind of the plot of the film, it's this kind of ragtag band of people who are shoplifting. They have their problems, but they're somehow making it or something, you know, and they're struggling. And because of, I was assuming they were going to be the typical beats in a movie like this, they didn't take place and it was very languid. And then in that last, you know, 20 minutes or whatever, they kind of hit all of a sudden and it is kind of hard to follow. Were threads dropped? I, I guess I feel like threads weren't dropped as much as, you don't have time to pick up on everything because everything is just very, very rapid fire. Yeah. Sure. Um, and I, I, I really liked that. And I really, I liked the way it ended. Mm. Um, the final shot, unfortunately I was talking to someone, we just watched this film last night with our film society. And afterwards I was talking to somebody in the lobby and I was kind of said, um, Hey, what was your kind of take on the very last shot? And they said, Oh, well, it was just this person looking out, you know, wondering where some certain people were. And I was like, Oh, well that's interesting because my take on that was the person jumped. Um, really? So, yes, absolutely. And because of the wow, way, no, I yeah, did not. Yeah. 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 Which makes it go in a very dark direction. Absolutely. But because the way the film is, it's like this person is lingering on a balcony. Let's just say that. Yeah. And they kind of mount this thing. And earlier in the film, someone had jumped over a railing and has something happened to them. And I felt like this was kind of a mirroring of, I'm going to (laughs) jump over this railing. And it really, I was like, Whoa. And then that was the very last shot of the film. So boy, no, I did not get that at all. Well, and there's, you know, and I think that's what's, you know, if you've ever listened to our show before you hear Alan, I talk about films and, you know, I'm a big fan a lot of times of, very open endings and let mm-hmm. you interpret things. Cause it makes for you know yeah. interesting discussions and sure. things like that. Um, so 
had it not been for the way the final 20 minutes of this had handled, I would think this film was okay, but it really elevated it in my mind. And I, I really, I wouldn't, I, I'm really glad they did the last 15, 20 minutes the way they yeah. did it. I really okay. liked it. Interesting. So. I, I felt the film, uh, I, I love spending time with the family members because I thought they were really all strong. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. is, it, it was, it was nice in that the whole time you are trying to starting to, you're trying to put pieces together to figure out what's going on. Right. Cause you're right. Very early on. You're, you're very, it's very clear through how they refer to one another or they talk about some past experiences that they're not your traditional family. And even when um, some things happen in the film and you think they're explaining certain relationships, they don't give you really time to kind of, you yeah. Focus on be like, wait, okay, so that means this person, nope, they they keep on trucking. You know? yeah, so sure. I could see how that would be, fr- that actually was frustrating to me, but then I just kind of said, I, I've kind of embraced it. And was like, that's kind of the whole confusion is, yeah. you know, the dynamics of this family, things are confusing, things aren't always perfect. Um, well, so yeah, the very second, I think I picked it up pretty early on that something was a little different with different. this family. Sure. And then that framed me for the whole rest of the film to say, okay, let's kind of, I want to see how this is all going to play out. And I want to see where some revelations are made that help me understand how they connect the dots here. So sure. I, I did like the film a lot too. Um, I, I was probably a little opposite with you. I, I, I actually liked the first 90 minutes and thought the ending while interesting and definitely put a different uh, twist and spin on the film as a whole. I felt like it was a little more choppy and a little more just not as cohesive an ending to really bring it all together as well. But hmm. again, uh, interesting. Uh, interesting film. And I think I, I had a good time with it for sure. Uh, I will say just a couple of things I'll call out. I liked all of the characters in the family. I, I liked okay. spending time with all of them, but I will say and my you could favorite. list them by name. Oh, is this person actually going to uh, get a name? Yeah. Okay. So the, the, <laughs> awesome. uh, the grandmother okay. who's played Grandma. by Karen Kiki I thought it was really interesting. I thought she was really good. She plays Hatsu Shibata, which is the, 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 the family name that they have all adopted, Shibata. Yeah, that's – yeah, so yeah, looking – that's the weird thing. You mentioned that because looking at IMDb, you see like all these character names and they all have that last name. And I'm like, wait, I, I wasn't really under the understanding that, that they had all adopted because their again, names were so confusing. So it's like, oh – well, I wish I, I wish that, you know, it's like, I almost needed arrows to come on and be like, yeah. this is so and so. You're like, Oh, I get it. They're all using this fake last yeah. or this name. Like I didn't even really pick up on that until I went to IMDb. Right. So, right. So confusing. I, I thought the grandmother was great. She was I just agree. very warm and very, just really just interesting to be with. And I love the way everybody responded to her. Like, mm-hmm. you know, she was the matriarch in this family and, Everybody treat her with that level of respect, which was so authentic to see in the family unit there. Um, and I thought the, the, the quote, father, unquote, um, which dad. again, we have to use as dad, <laughs> sure. uh, played by Lily Frankie, uh, was also really good. He was a really interesting character in that if there was anybody that I kind of wanted to have more backstory on, like in a somehow I found out more about them, he would be the one because I'm just... You know, and then, finding out his role with his quote wife right. later in the film, you wonder how that came about, right? And you know, yeah. and and then he had some different jobs and roles, and how he got into shoplifting. All that I think would be really interesting to explore. So, yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting too because I think the film, who knows what the filmmaker's intentions were with not giving us a lot of backstory, but it's kind of this thing where they set out very minimal facts. They do reveal some more, but then others. They're just not going to fill in. Yeah, and it's, right. I could see how that could be really frustrating with people, but he's just like, well, you're just not going to get that. You know, yep. and maybe leaves you wanting more or maybe just leaves you frustrated. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, because you that first scene where he is with, I'll just call him, Bull, but this guy actually um, has a he's name. He's with uh, Shota. 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 So Shota mm-hmm. actually, his name was one of the few that I was like, okay, that's the boy. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the, the way they communicate when they are shoplifting mm-hmm. Um, especially that first sequence is kind of shot kind of like a um, high sequence. Yeah. And, you know, it's panning around this grocery store and they do all these dolly shots and you see them kind of give one another signals up to there's this, I guess it's kind of like a routine that the boy does right before he shoplifts. He mm-hmm. kind of has this, these hand motions that he does really cool. And that kind of comes back later when he trains the little adopted girl yeah. how to shoplift. Who um, is a Yuri. Yuri. Okay. Mm-hmm. There's, there's another name. <laughs> so, yeah. 
Um, yeah, it was just really well intentioned and well shot, and there's these little clever touches that um, I really, really appreciated. But like, you know, the acting, like you're saying, is really good. It was just, I guess, the pace, the languid pace at the beginning, I could appreciate, but I think um, the ending really made me like like it. Otherwise, I just would have said, "Oh, I may have given it the fine tag that hmm. you gave the okay. wife." <laughs> Interesting. Well, I I, I like the beginning parts better, and I don't think the ending hurt or greatly enhanced my enjoyment of the film. So I was pretty, pretty good all the way through. Um, Something that I think you mentioned in our discussion last night that I wanted to have you touch on again, because I hadn't thought about it, but it was interesting to see how this film has a take of Japan that I guess I would describe to somebody as like if David Gordon Green was shooting a Japan yeah. movie. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's more like smaller neighborhoods, um, Grant, I mean, the whole focus is on this family that is kind of on the fringes. So they're not living in the big high rises. They're not the well-to-do of Japan. They're right. you know, more of the poorer people. But just the way it was shot just seemed more kind of small time, smaller scale. And that was a side you didn't really get to see. And you, sure. So it was it was nice to see. Yeah, no, I agree. I, 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 I'm always a fan of films that can expose me to slices of society that I may not have as much awareness of or familiarity with but especially when you go to another country and you do that that's even more fascinating to watch so um of course the the problem is we can't really attest to authenticity and just really other than talking to people like luckily we were able to do i was able to do at one of our screening nights some people from japan who could actually comment on the authenticity of what we were seeing which was nice to hear yeah there were moments in the film where there's they were eating and uh you'd said that the person was commenting on how in the eating of the ramen noodles that was a very common thing to like basically be as loud as you wanted to because it was like a comment on the food and like Mm -hmm. how good it was and stuff and that was kind of jarring for us because you know in an americanized film you don't hear people making eating noises because that's just not unless it's for comical right unless it's for comic which Mm -hmm. this is not for that um also something else you know they seem to have a lot of there was kind of the the ritual motions of the shoplifting that you know was interesting but then there was something in the very beginning which was something that was dropped which i was curious of and i could never get an explanation i'd have to research it online but something about putting nails in your shoes as if it gives you good luck or something like that so yeah, my worst, I, I hope, you know, <laughs> that they don't remake this movie and make it well, Americanized yeah. or anything, because I think that yeah. would just totally ruin it, because this is a perfect entry for yeah. the Japanese foreign film for the Oscars, because, like you say, it seems like it really encapsulates a segment of Japanese culture that, in a time show, you know, it's like modern day, so it's mm. kind of an interesting yeah. segment that you hope many people check out. And look into I, I agree. I think it's worth definitely worth a watch. I think it's an interesting film. And, uh, you know, I, it seems like this director seems uh, really be interested in the idea of what makes a family right. and, you know, what the true definition of family is and, and how, because one of his previous films, like father, like son dealt a lot with this whole family relationships between, you know, father, son and, and, and yeah. others. And it, again, it's that question of what truly makes a family versus, and uh, I, I have not. seen that film. It's been a long time. I think the guy who plays the dad in this film was the father in that film, I think. Oh, could be. Um, and it's about, I, I believe it's been a while, but I think it was like adopted kids. And yeah, it was, it's a really interesting film. So yeah, the guy clearly, the director clearly has interest in family dynamics. So. Yes. Yeah, you're right. Uh, Lily Frankie was in Like Father, Like Son, one of the top four or five billing characters and in it. it so. may have been up for an Oscar back when it came out as well. I cannot remember. I I want to say so because unfortunately my exposure to Japanese cinema is not that broad. And usually the way I'll make a point to see something is if it gets nominated for something, I'll be like, Oh, I should, I should make a point to check this out. You know? Right. And I checked that film out when it came out a couple of years ago. And I have a feeling that it must've been nominated. Who knows? Maybe even if I don't think it something. is I don't really think it was. Yeah. Maybe so it was I don't just a lot of people saying, check it. this guy out. Could <laughs> so. be. Yeah. And it was, we did get a lot of people requesting that film when it came out. So, all right, good. Well, that's, uh, yeah, that's shoplifters. Do you have anything else you want to add to that? Um, not really. I guess if <laughs> there again, I would have to watch it again. Uh, I will say, you know, overall, I'm really positive. If I had to say a negative, I would say that sometimes I felt like the translations at the bottom of the screen were actually putting words into the characters' mouths. Mm-hmm. Um, and I talked to other people after the screen last night, and they're like, no, no, I don't feel that way. 
but it would be like basically there was an instance with the grandmother and an instance with the boy where they were having them say some words that were very key and very like important. Mm. And the only way to know would be to sit with somebody who was, that the subtitles weren't on and be like, okay, do you think we were really meant to hear that? A, the, with the grandmother, it was like repeating of a phrase several times. I'm like, okay, maybe she said it once, but I don't think she said it as many times as they're kind of making mm. it out. And then with the boy, he utters this key word that, I mean, so soft. He's like riding on a train that I felt like in a way they were trying to pound something home with the subtitles that I don't know if it was really there. I, I it's think kind of it a might weird be. thing. I don't think I've ever yeah. felt that way hmm. before about subtitles, but it's kind of strange. Well, it might have been different if it was not subtitled. And, you know, we as an American audience listening to English speaking actors, even if you heard him mouth something right. or the grandmother mouth something, we would have figured out what it was. But right. here we are trying to see what they're mouthing. So it just kind or, of takes away a little bit of the nuance, I guess. A little bit. Yeah, yeah it does. So. You know, subtitles is tough. It's tough. It I mean, it it, I mean, I would rather read read the subtitles than hear the dubbed in voices. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. But it's still tough because you're taking your fa- your eyes away from the sure. face. You're you're. Yeah, you know, sometimes there's there's moments where the words are not meant to be as clearly identifiable on the screen, but yet subtitles pretty much gives you exactly what <laughs> it the, spells the clear, it out for yeah. you, literally. Yeah. So, I uh, granted, it's the best option we have right now to watch foreign films, but I wonder if my in, enjoyment might have even been enhanced more if it hadn't been for the having to read the subtitles. Sure, on it. Yeah, yeah, I probably so. Um, yeah. And like I mentioned, like a nightmare for me. You know, we talked about before a couple of years ago how they're supposedly remaking Tony Erdman into an American film. (laughs) And I don't think they would do that because this is so much with like, you know, aspects of the Japanese culture and stuff that, but you know, who knows if this film were to win the Oscar, they're like, Oh, let's make a shoplifters American version. And I just think that would totally kill it. That would not be good. Yeah. Well, shoplifters was still playing in some select uh, cinemas. I'm sure within a few weeks or a month or so of us publishing this episode, it will probably be available online. Uh, it is nominated for the best foreign film award at this year's Academy Awards, one of five nominations, same category that Roma is in. So I do think that that might be a tough uphill battle for shoplifters <laughs> to pull out a win, but probably so. <laughs> uh, Chris sounds like he's in favor of pulling for them to see if it can uh, pull out the upset or not. With that. Yeah. So that's Shoplifters. Again, director and writer uh, Hir- Hirokazu Kurita. And uh, we uh, both are positive on it. Chris may be walking away with even a more positive opinion than me, which is I awesome. I think so. Yeah, yeah. That's not too bad. That's good. So that's our two film reviews. we got The Wife and we've got Shoplifters. So Chris, what we're going to do is take a really quick break, come back. We'll hit a couple of movie news items. And then we'll end the show with our recommendation for the episode from each of us to recommend a film. So stay tuned. You're listening to Foot Candle Films here on TheMesh.TV. We'll get back to your show in a moment. Just a reminder, you're listening to The Mesh, an online media network of shows and programs ranging from business to arts, sports to entertainment, music to community. All programs are available on the website as well as through iTunes and YouTube. Find out more at themesh.tv and give us feedback on what you like. And now, as promised, back to your show. Welcome back to Foot Candle Films here on themesh.tv. Alan and Chris here. We just finished our reviews of the films The Wife and Shoplifters at the beginning of the episode. Now what we want to do is move on to some movie news uh, where we talk about some news items of interest, uh, upcoming film projects or things that we're hearing in the rumor mill. Before we do, Chris, just a quick note to everybody listening that you are listening to this show, Foot Candle Films, as a podcast. And what that means is that we put out episodes generally every two weeks or so, about twice a month, we put out an episode. And just like a TV show or a radio program, you can actually set it up to record these programs for you and download them to you whenever they're available. You do that by subscribing to the podcast. So what that means is find a podcast application. You may be listening to one now. Uh, Apple has a podcast apps on their on their iPhones. You've got uh, Google Play will do uh, do podcast uh, playback. There's others like iHeartRadio we just showed up on. Uh, we got other groups and places where you can find us. Anywhere where podcasts are being listened to, you can find our show. But you want to subscribe to it. And what that means is every time we put out a new episode, you will automatically get it downloaded to your device 
without you having to go and find it or search for it or go on a website anywhere. So we do encourage you, if you have fun listening to this, uh, if you agree or disagree with any of our takes, we'll even give you a chance at the end of ways to reach out to us. But we do encourage you to subscribe to the show so that way you can stay in tune with it. And do the same with any of the other shows on the Mesh Network. That Again, that network can be found on the web at themesh.tv. That's T-H-E-M-E-S-H dot TV. So Chris, let's move into some movie news. I've got three news items to spring on you here, and let's get some reactions right. and thoughts. We kind of went a little more independent small films for our two reviews, so let's go ahead and turn back the dial and go a little a little pulpy, a little science fiction-y uh, for our, our three news items, if, Sounds uh, good. if you're on board for that. Absolutely. Chris, what did you ever think of uh, the film Dune? Oh, I liked it. Did you? But, and it's mean, David Lynch's Dune. I know you're a David Lynch fan. And he kind of stepped away from it because apparently... Yeah, there was a little controversy yeah, with all so, that. But um, but it, it was visually interesting. Um, it's not a perfect film. Okay. Oddly enough, I thought like, oh, I bet if I read the book, this is probably like blasphemy to some people, <laughs> many people. But um, I bet if I read the book, I'll be disappointed because I'll see how the film didn't capture all these things. I read the book and it was just, you know, it was kind of old school science fiction. And so, I don't know, I kind of thought like, yeah, I think the movie did a pretty decent job of trying to do okay. all this visual stuff. And so, I like the old movie, but it, it's not perfect. And probably now it would seem very like campy and yeah. not really work. But. Well, here's the good news. And I think we've actually mentioned this kind of as we've talked about uh, the director of, of Villeneuve, yeah. Denise Villeneuve is doing a remake of Dune. Which I'm excited about. Well, yeah. See, Dune is not a property I have any interest in. However, oh, wow. I really like Villeneuve's you know, directing style. Oh, I've yeah. liked everything he's done. I liked his Blade Runner 2049. Uh, even all the way back to Prisoners. I really liked the film Prisoners. Uh, you liked Enemy with the Giant Enemy. Spider. Enemy. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I liked all of it. So sure. all of his films I've seen, I've been a fan. Arrival, you know, yeah. great films. Yeah. Agreed. So him doing Dune, I'm on board for it because this may be the film that can actually kind of get me into that into that story and, and kind of an, uh, appreciate it. What I wanted to mention, though, is is uh, he's been racking up some casting announcements hmm. on this film. I don't know if you've seen this list that's compiled. I just but heard people gosh. ranting, but I actually haven't. Don't really know of the people, but I've heard people making jokes about how it's like all of Hollywood is going yes. to be in Dune. So here's where we are right now: uh, Stellan Skarsgård, okay, Oscar Isaac, okay, Zendaya, huh. okay, uh, Javier Bardem. Dave Bautista, who we yeah. he did used in Blade Runner twenty forty nine, also in Guardians of the Galaxy with right. a different director. Sure. Uh, Charlotte Rampling, hmm. Timothy Chalamet, Rebecca Ferguson. Okay. So all all yeah. this, I'm like, all, yeah, all big great. names. These sound people. really great. And uh, I thought this one was interesting. The Have one there that been kind of, names assigned to any of the people. Um, somewhere, yes. Maybe huh. I'll pull that up in a second. See because how the many one of them. That, one that kind of worries me is, I mean, <laughs> you know, there's the Paul Atreides who is the uh, Kyle MacLachlan character in, or the Kyle MacLachlan. He was the actor. The character was Paul Atreides in the original Dune, and he's kind of the the central figure. All right. So, uh, which which character is that? I'm sorry, Paul Atreides. Okay. Yes, that's Timothy Chalamet. Oh no, that's yep. what I was when you when you said his name. I was like, oh. I wonder if that's who Paul Atreides is. I mean, Timothy Chalamet, you know, um, call me by your name. Um, not that he was a bad actor, but something about like, I, I don't know. I feel like maybe he's like Hollywood. It is Hollywood's yeah. it boy There's right a now. Bit of that so right now. A little, a little of that worries me. Um, okay. But you know, I think he can. It's not that he can't act. So I don't, I don't know. Well, it's Rebecca not, Ferguson is Lady Jessica. Oh uh, yeah, I can see that. Zendaya is Shani. Okay. Uh, now, a couple of new names that just popped up just like yesterday. <laughs> okay. Josh Brolin, hmm. uh, who worked with the Villeneuve in uh, Sicario. Right. Okay. Right. Josh Brolin's going to be Gurner Hollick. Okay. A ring a bell there, I guess. I think, yeah, I think that was um, Picard. <laughs> yep. No, it was, uh, yeah, you're right. It was. Patrick Stewart. Patrick Stewart played Sorry. that part in the yeah. uh, the 80, 80 version. So, yeah, I do, yeah. And then uh, Jason Momoa was just added hmm. as Duncan Idaho. Oh, <laughs> okay. 
so, which is like a friend of, or yeah. becomes like a mentor or whatever. I think, if I'm remembering the names correctly, to Paul, to Timothy Shallon. All right, so, well, I, I have know. no idea what any of this is about, <laughs> but... You know, giant worms. With, well, exactly. But with this <laughs> cast and with the director in yeah. charge, I'm I'm on board. I say bring it. I'm I'm looking forward to it. So that should be really interesting. I mean, and Villeneuve definitely has a handle on visual storytelling. I mean, with like yeah, Blade yeah. Runner. So yeah, can he do science fiction? Arrival on Blade Runner? Absolutely. Um, Even Enemy. It, yeah. Will the mm. Will the story make any more sense than it did in the <laughs> Dan Lynch version? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that that's the part. I remember watching part of Dune before. I think it was on TV, like, you know, when it came out on network. Right? And yeah, I had no clue what was going on. <laughs> so I just kind of checked out pretty early. I remember yeah. on that one. Yeah. All right, Chris, let's talk about something here. Okay. I honestly don't know how to feel about this. Hmm. So, all right, a little backstory here. My wife has been uh, homesick for the last day or two. And so, you know, I've been kind of checking in on her, you know, as I can. My my wife, when she's sick, she finds herself just kind of like on the couch, tending to a wrapped up blanket, and it's watching 80s movies. Okay. That's just kind of her thing. It's like comfort food. It's like, you know, a hot bowl of soup. It's just a familiar 80s movie, like a little pop, pop classic called 80s movie. So I got home last night, and she was in the middle of Ghostbusters, the original Ghostbusters. Okay. Which you know, I've seen thirty plus times. I've but, had it as a recommendation on this show. Oh yeah, I think at some point. But I was still sat down. I'm like, oh, I'm still going to watch this with sure. you. I mean, I I'm not going to not watch this with you. <laughs> so, and it still holds up as so so good. Yeah. So we had a Ghostbusters reboot. Yep. A couple of years, three or maybe years ago or so, that you were not too high on. I think I came away a little more positive than you did, saying at least I felt not, I felt there were some things that were promising in it. From best I remember, you just didn't really care for it. I was not a big fan. I yeah. think expectations, because you know there was all that blowback about it being an all female cast. People were all negative, and I wanted to just walk out just championing it and being like, "Oh, it's so great! I like it as much as the original." And I think I was really let down that I couldn't be that champion. And yeah, I just didn't think it was that great. Well, so here we go. They are working on a new Ghostbusters movie. Okay. And the word is it will officially be the Ghostbusters 3, meaning it will be a continuation of the original stories. Okay. Yeah. It's weird. Um, Does that mean they're getting the people back that were in the original? That's the impression. Bill actually going to sign on? That's the impression right now. Wow. Now, they have released a couple of pieces of information about this film. They've actually released a teaser trailer. Really? Oh, yeah. Which doesn't show you a whole lot. Words <laughs> doesn't show you a whole lot. Uh, basically, it the shows music. the outside of a barn, and then the camera slowly goes into the barn, and you hear the Ghostbusters music, the creepy ghost, yeah. like when the ghosts are kind da, of around. Da, 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 yeah. yeah, and then it comes up, and there's a sheet over a vehicle, and the sheet kind of blows up in the wind, and it's the Ecto one. Right, and then that's it. That's the whole yeah. teaser. Okay. So what they're basically letting you know is it's going to be the original storyline because here's the actual car. Right, but I do think there's a passage of time where somehow this, you know, the car's now in storage somewhere, somewhere out. They have released a couple little bits saying that there's like some characters in the film that they're casting for right now that are all younger, like kids. A lot of people online are questioning, what does that mean? Are they going to, is this a kid's version of Ghostbusters? I think that what people are trying to piece together is maybe it's a younger kids trying to resurrect the ghostbusters or trying to bring mm. back the ghostbusters or something. Anyway, it's like a ghostbusters field of dreams. <laughs> maybe. I don't know. And of course we do have the somewhere? fact that of the four original ghostbusters, one of them has passed away, of yeah. course. Um, so that makes it a little more challenging there with Harold Ramis. Right. Um, but here's the part that gives me a little hope. Do you know who the director is? No. Jason Reitman, uh, Ivan Reitman's son. Right. Now, Jason Reitman, I like yeah, Tully. We talked about yeah. recently. We I really like liked. That's a fan. Uh, go all the way back to uh, uh, up and up in the air and Juno. Mm-hmm. He's a good filmmaker. He's had some missteps. We've talked about several Labor times Day. on the show with Just Labor Day. Words. And then the one he did with Adam Sandler was supposedly not very good either, but he redeemed himself in my mind with Tully, which yeah. I thought was great. And you, sure. you had it as one of your top five favorite films of the year. I believe. I believe that's right. So to hear that he's picking up his father's mantle and is going to direct a Ghostbusters movie, I'm like, okay, I'm willing to give this a shot, but 
Uh, I was one of the guys that did not care for Ghostbusters 2. I thought that was a real big letdown of a film from the original. Uh, I've probably seen Ghostbusters 2 maybe three times where I've seen the original 30. So that kind of tells you a little bit where I am. I have seen Ghostbusters 2. I liked it. And I think I probably gave it a pass because I was in that age where basically I just really wanted to like it because it was a Ghostbusters film. It's like... That's the age where Star Wars movies could do no wrong. So right. a Ghostbuster sequel could probably. We didn't have a very wrong. critical eye at that point. So yeah. <laughs> right. Well, the minute the Statue so. of Liberty started walking down the street, I'm like, yeah, okay, this isn't working for me. So, <laughs> but I'm I'm I like Jason Reitman enough, and I love the original so much. So I'm like, all right, if they want to give it another shot, I I I'm fine with that. I'm not one of these guys that says no no no, don't do that. You can't go out. That's going to ruin the other ones. No, it doesn't. It doesn't ruin it. So they're just going to totally discount the new Ghostbusters that came out. Well, yes. Even though Bill Murray was in this one. Yes. But, of course, he wasn't playing you know, right. his character. Right. Um, and a couple of the women that were the stars of the new Ghostbusters have already gone online and are a little upset, which I, I get. I mean, like, I'd be kind of ticked off, too. It's like, you know, they did, I, in my mind, it was a decent movie, not a great movie, but I think it at least tried something a little different. Right. And I think all the girls, the, the, the actresses in it were wonderful. I thought they were all really talented and fun to watch. So it is kind of a shame if they're not woven into this thing somehow. But anyway, hmm. we're not the one writing the film. Nope. So who knows? <laughs> but Ghostbusters 3, it is actually Does happening. the teaser trailer have a date or it just says coming soon? Yeah, it's really? uh, summer 2020. Wow. A year and a half from now or a little over a year from now. Wow. Start shooting right now, and uh, that's where they're going. Interesting. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, Ghostbusters 3. All right, last thing, last item, uh, just because I told you we're going to stay in the whole pulp field right sure. now. So let's go. We got we to got squeeze in a comic book okay. movie discussion. Talking about Batman. Okay. It's been a few episodes since we've talked about Batman. <laughs> so let's go ahead and do that. Well, you know, DC's just had a bunch of bad, bad stuff happen well, to them. Well, Ben him. Affleck is no longer Batman. Gotcha. So he had, what was it, two movies he did? He did uh, Dawn of Justice or whatever. Superman and then Justice Batman, League. And then Justice League. And he had a, he had a small part in the Suicide, uh, Squad. Suicide Squad. Right. So but he's, he's done. officially said, I'm done. gone. No standalone The Batman movie. He's hanging up his cape. Yep. Now okay. there is a movie, The Batman, that is being made. Matt Reeves is the, the director attached to it. He's uh, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I think okay. he did Cloverfield. Did he do Cloverfield? Maybe. I don't know. I think he may have. Yeah. Abrams produced it, but then this, you're saying that guy. Directed. I think he was the director of a uh, Cloverfield. Cloverfield. I'll, I'll check that out while we're talking. Okay. But Ben, Ben, the uh, bat fleck is gone. Okay. Okay. So that leads me to follow up on a conversation you and I had several months ago about who would make a good Batman. Mm. Now at that time, and I've got, I know we've got audio proof of me saying this. <laughs> I said John Hamm should be Batman. Oh, yes. Do you remember me I do remember that? that. Absolutely. Because I wanted a little bit older. I could see him playing a little more grizzled, you know, a gruff version that's been through a lot. You know, because John Hamm is a little older than some of the hot, young Hollywood stars that people keep batting around. Right. But I think he'd be awesome. I think he'd be so good. And so bat, I think you wanted the hashtag bat ham. <laughs> that's right. I did bat ham with right. two, with two M's. Right. Yeah. So, uh, but now the word is that they're going for a younger direction for the character. They're going to try to take on the Batman year one arc from the comics, which I can tell you that was Frank Miller did that mm-hmm. back in the day. That was one of his first Batman uh, projects. And it was really a retelling of from the very first day he became Batman, kind of going through like the motions the first year hmm. of being being that character. Well, that's convenient because Gotham is also going to round up or wind up. And Gotham the, does the TV show does finish in the here in a, a few weeks because right. it's almost at the end of its final season. And that yeah, so it's like right interesting. Yep. So um, I have a new favorite now. Given so that they information, they haven't announced. No, they haven't. Batman. But okay. knowing they're going younger, I'm like, all right, well, they're not going to go John Hamm, right? Timothy One day Chalamet. when they do a Dark Knight Returns <laughs> adaptation, Got you. Frank Miller's, uh, where it's him, you know, off in the future as an older man coming back. Sure, give me John Hamm for that. I'll be I'll be waiting for that. But hey, until now, I do have a new favorite pick. You're, you're going to say Timothy Chalamet? <laughs> no, no, I'm not. Okay. Sorry, sorry. He's got Dune. He, he's he he's all wrapped he's, up in Dune. He can't do Batman right now. True. Um, 
No, you know what? It's it's Army Hammer. Is he young enough? I think so. Okay. Yeah, I think he could pull it off. Okay. So a little backstory there. So there's somebody who's been in a movie with Timothy Chalamet. But oh, that's true. Chalamet. That's true. <laughs> okay. I think Army well Army Hammer is probably on the older end of young. Right. But I think he could still pull it off. Little backstory there. So George Miller, who is the Mad Max director, mm-hmm. Australian director that uh, did all the Max Mad, Mad Max movies and Babe as well. <laughs> okay. For the longest time, he was working on a Justice League movie years ago. This okay. is before the whole DC Universe thing started up. And it was supposedly cast. It was the script was in hand, but they hmm. never got around to actually making it for whatever reason. Army Hammer was slated to play really Batman in that point. I think I think that could work. So I'm 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 putting all my energy into into a bat hammer right now is kind of where I'm going with this on this one. Yeah, it's interesting. I like Arm Hammer. You and I are some of the only people who I think who liked the Lone Ranger that he was in. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's good. I, I don't see him having the requisite dark side that I always associate with hmm. Batman. Yeah. Um, but and actually, I would have had the same problem. I think John Hamm's a good actor, but kind of the dark brooding side with him. I guess I may have had a problem with John Hamm, but maybe not. But Army Hammer, yeah, I'm, I'm sure he can do it. It's just I don't see it right off the bat. But. See, what I like about Army Hammer is that, in my mind, Bruce Bruce Wayne has to be oh, he's, really oh, sharp, oh, handsome, yeah. and he's got to be a playboy. He's got to be light and aloof. Oh, yeah. But then the minute he's away from the public, it's the well, persona and, changes. And that's what, yeah. yeah, both Ham and Army Hammer would totally have the Bruce Wayne side mm-hmm. down. Oh, yeah, in spades. They got that. It's the switch yeah. of when you become the, the darker. So could be. I don't know. I, I don't like know. to think he may have it in him. Oh, I'm I'd love sure. to see that happen. So um so that's where we are. We're back to square one. What is it gonna be? One. Bat hammer, I guess is That's why I said bat hammer. Okay. It's now hashtag that's your hashtag. bat hammer. Gotcha. So Okay. Bat ham is gone. <laughs> well at least tabled for a while tabled. until a future Batman older Batman project. But for now, younger Batman project, yes, Bat Hammer is the Hashtag to use. Okay. So everybody listening, please change <laughs> the hashtags you've been putting online for the last several months. Sure. And change it to Bat Hammer. Please and thank you. Okay. Fair all right. So that's all the news items I have, uh, Chris, for us. Uh, again, I just had to kind of geek it up a little bit with some of those other project discussions, get some sci-fi and comics in there to kind of balance out our show a little bit. So let's move on to our recommendations. Okay. Chris and I both pick a film from our our list of our history of watching films that either we've recently caught up with or just one that kind of crossed our mind that we found a lot of interesting things to say positive about. We want to kind of recommend them to the audience here. One film each. So Chris, I've done all the talking here. Why don't you go ahead and take over and I'll give you uh, your recommendation. Okay. So let me tell you how dedicated I am to this show. To this show. To this show. Okay. Foot Candle Films here on The Mesh. I am so dedicated that as I was sitting with my laptop this morning eating breakfast, I got an email from PBS, Public Broadcasting System, and they said, hey, just so you know, Hale County this morning, this evening is now streaming online. Oh, that was nice of them to let you know. Interesting. And that is Russ, or what's his name? Rommel Ross's Oscar-nominated documentary. It is in a dreamy, it's a dreamy, intimate journey through the world of Hale County, Alabama, a richly detailed glimpse into the life of America's black belt. Okay, mm-hmm. yes, I just read that from the email that they sent me. Yep. But I was like, hey, that is nominated. I think I'll check it out. Didn't get to watch the whole thing, obviously, at breakfast. I don't mm-hmm. wake up that early. <laughs> but I did capture the first, you know, 20 or 30 minutes of it. Okay. It is interesting. And, um, I'm not going to say it will probably beat out something like Minding the Gap, which is my personal favorite, the one I think should win. Um, and mm. I haven't seen – I've only seen RGB or, or sorry, RBG. RBG, yes. <laughs> I've only seen that one, so I don't really know of the other two. Um, but it's really awesome that this documentary got nominated because it is very – yeah, there's, it's just a bunch of, it's literally like a bunch of footage. You can't say there's an overarching story mm-hmm. that I've, you know, have picked up on the first 30 minutes. Yeah. There are sometimes individuals names that get put up on the screen so you can try to follow them, mm-hmm. but it's just done in a very interesting style. It reminds me of a documentary that I saw from years ago that a lot of critics liked. I was not one of them. 
um, called Leviathan, and oh, that right. was this fishing boat. <laughs> and you know, it was it was just all these cameras they've been placed all around this fishing boat. There wasn't a lot of dialogue. It was just all these like random images and shots. Some people felt like it was very poetic in nature and really spoke to them. It didn't to me. This film, however, you know, you talk about languid pacing that we were kind of mentioning and, you know, shoplifters and how it can be slow. Yeah, the whole film, I think, runs a little over an hour. I could see how some people would get frustrated with it. Mm -hmm. But it's just a really interesting glimpse into this community, or I guess it's a county in Alabama, and the fact that they're not really trying to overtly tell you anything or prove you anything, but just because of some of the conversations that come around and some of the footage is like genius. Um, some of the different shots will end up, I don't want to spoil any of them, but they're just, there's some in a barber shop. Um, there's this woman working on her little girl's hair and like, yeah, it's just, and some of the hmm. ways they shoot things. Sometimes they're an extreme close up. Yeah. And, um, there's this montage just for, and some of you, some of it you could say is kind of like trick, trick photography where there's this practice at a gym and there are all these people that are going up for like slam dunks and they show them taking off and going, getting right to the rim and then it cuts to the next person. So you never actually see the basket being made. And it's just really, it's kind of an interesting and yeah, it's kind of a trick, but it's really neat because it, you know, what is that saying? Well, it's kind of up to you. What is that saying? Mm. And it's just, it's interesting. I'm not going to say it's a documentary for everyone, but I found it, to be interesting, and I think it is the guy who, Ramel Ross, he apparently was a teacher who moved to this area to help teach, I think, basketball and photography. Mm-hmm. And he wrote, directed, edited, and produced this thing. So it's like, it's his baby. Mm-hmm. And I think he took over like a year or two years to do it. Um because I think there's actually footage in it from um, the eclipse that happened in 2017 or whenever. That right, was. sure. So, like, it's been a while in the making. Huh. Um, probably took forever to edit just because he had a lot of footage. Yeah, sure. But uh, it's something interesting to check out if you're in, and it's free online. I go to your local PBS station. You can probably find it and can stream it and watch it. So, hopefully, after I finish watching it, it'll still be a recommendation. But I, I think it... I think it's probably worth your time, especially if you're interested in up and coming filmmakers of which I think this is his first effort in making a documentary. So okay, cool. that's my well, recommendation. Well, once you finish watching the whole thing, you know, come back and let <laughs> us know if your opinions change at all. But otherwise it sounds like it's an early initial uh, review uh, or a, a recommendation. Yeah. When we that. do our recap of the Oscars, I'll just have to say, you know, and if it wins, I'll be like, well, I didn't think it had a chance of winning. Like, <laughs> that's, I guess that's, that's my thing. Grant, you know, documentaries are not like the other ones that are up for best picture. Like everybody's usually heard of the best picture nominees documentaries. Yeah. You can get some smaller ones in there that you haven't heard of. And for me, this was just such a surprise because it seemed like such a small movie for it to beat out something, for example, like "Won't You Be My Neighbor?" Yeah, sure. That's pretty amazing, you know. And it's a totally different type of film, but it's just really, it's really interesting. So. Cool. Okay. Well, that is uh, Hale yeah. County this morning, this evening, okay. which is kind of an gotcha. it's a little, odd title. Yeah, it's a little long title, but I'm glad uh, you had to pull it up in front of you there, so I didn't yeah. remember it. So, <laughs> yeah. all right, good recommendation, and it is available through PBS. You said yes, and it may also be on some streaming services. Maybe you can find it on iTunes or whatever. But I just happened to see that it was free through PBS. So well, free is that. good. That works yeah, out. Free okay. is free. <laughs> all right, good. So I'm going to go in a completely different direction okay. for the film. Um, the film I've got is from 1993 that I cannot believe I haven't recommended this film before because hmm. back in the mid nineties, this was like one of my absolute favorite films. Okay. Now I have recently had a chance, somewhat recently had a chance to revisit the film and I will say, uh, maybe it doesn't hold quite the allure it did back in the mid nineties for a couple of reasons I'll go into, but I still think it's a very strong film okay. and it has some, some of still one of some of my favorite mid nineties film moments, you know, from that period of time. It's the film True Romance by oh. Tony Scott director, written by Quentin Tarantino. Right. Uh, starring a Mr. Christian Slater. So Christian Slater being in The Wife kind of hmm. helped remind me that, hey, you know what? There were some movies that Christian Slater was in I really liked. And, oh, yeah, Pump of course. Up the Volume, Heathers. Come on. Well, Heathers, yes. Uh, you Pump didn't up like the Pump Up the Volume? Yeah. I've, got a, I've got a personal story from college about Pump Up the Volume <laughs> that 
makes me not be able to enjoy that film as you much. tried Sorry. to go out and be a renegade dj pirate yes. radio dj and got put in jail. and i had the same jack oh, nicholson type of banter and in and, and impersonation and christian slater totally just ripped me off in I that see. movie. okay yeah. fair enough. no actually it's a guy next door to us in our dorm oh, dear. had a big pump up the volume poster in his room and that's all he talked about was that film for like a good month and was this the same gentleman that had an infatuation with the pixies bingo yeah. <laughs> yes you are right so by this point if you're listening to this show and you're wondering <laughs> wait a minute i like the pixies in college i knew alan jackson in college and i also like pump up the volume <laughs> i'm sorry yes i'm talking about you <laughs> so, you're a great guy just you know it was a little much at that time um for a little while so anyway back to the back to the review Okay. So it's true romance. Uh, Tony Scott, who is Ridley Scott's brother, yes. uh, unfortunately no longer with us. He he did uh, die uh, several years back, mm-hmm. um, very sadly. But in the 90s, man, the late 80s to 90s, this guy kind of had the style movies going on. Um, can't say they were always always the best films out there, but he did do Top Gun in the, the mid to late 80s. I know you're a fan of Top Gun. I like Top Gun. I You're do. You're excited for the sequel, I think. I'm curious about the sequel, I guess. Okay. I don't know if I'm excited Fair yet. Um, he did also Crimson Tide, which is one of my favorite 90s movies as well. I love Crimson Tide. He did some other Days of Thunder. Can't really say I was a big fan of that. Spy Game, I thought was a good movie hmm. with uh, Robert Redford and Brad Pitt from the, I think, from the early 2000s or maybe late 1990s. He's done a lot of movies, a lot of very uh, visual style to the films, a lot of frenetic, uh, fast editing and cuts and all. Right. And so True Romance in some parts really lives up to that. But I also feel like True True Romance was probably Tony Scott's, the closest thing he had to a masterpiece. Oh. As far as a, hmm. I'm going to do all of my visual flourishes. I'm going to do the extreme violence that I can also do in films. A lot of gunplay and a lot of. Uh, machismo, you know, a lot of just male alpha characters, Hmm. but I'm also going to couch it with a pretty decent love story and some really interesting characters. And I'm going to tie it to Quentin Tarantino's words and dialogue. Hmm. It's like, to me, this is everything worked in this film. Okay. Now that was me back in 1993, 94. Um, But let me just kind of, for anybody who's not familiar with the film, uh, Clarence played by Christian Slater marries a call girl named Alabama and they both steal cocaine from her pimp and they try to sell it as, in Hollywood as you do, as you do <laughs> uh, while the owners of the cocaine try to help reclaim it. So it is a drug crime movie, but there's just a lot of the first 30 minutes, the the relationship between Clarence and Alabama, I think is really great. It's just okay. a really nice touching love story early on. There are some uh, pretty good action-y gunfight sequences. There's some really interesting characters. You've got Gary Oldman playing the pimp. Right. Really over the top, but <laughs> having fun with it. Sure. Uh, you've got uh, Dennis Hopper playing uh, Clarence's father. You've got Christopher Walken playing somebody who's trying to uh, criminally involved as well. Some great scenes, some great moments, some great dialogue. However, I will say, oh, here's the, well, I'm just going to say it does drop down a couple notches. Oh, we are, uh, you know, we're in a different time as a society and I'm in a different age. Gotcha. Watching the movie now. It's like, wow, there is a huge amount and great deal of misogyny. Okay. There's a huge deal of racism. Wow. Uh, homophobia has kind of played up. It's a lot of things that are, are not, they weren't cool then. Definitely not cool now. Got you. But, you know, at the same time, me being older and looking back on it, I'm like, Ugh, there's some parts of this that are just downright ugly hmm. as a film. That being said, I'm still going to say I think it's worth watching because I think there's a, a lot going on that's really good. And again, I thinking about Christian Slater as an actor, I'm like, you know what? This was a movie of his I really, really liked. Patricia Arquette, you know, who's been getting a lot of great acclaim for other roles she's been doing now. Right. She actually... Uh, one, I think, uh, Golden Globe or or something for the the mini series she's doing with Ben Stiller, hmm. that's on Showtime. Okay. Um, and then of course she was in uh, Boyhood and right. got some acclaim for that. This is an early role for her, but uh, she was also really good in this too. <laughs> so, True Romance, I still think it's a good movie. I think it's got some great dialogue, some great scenes, a great opening 
uh, sequence with the two of them uh, developing the relationship. But just know that it is a product of Tony Scott from the mid-90s at his peak. And it does fuel every single thing from Tony Scott's repertoire. You could throw it a film. And it is a little ugly in times and a little, you know, just playing off some some th- some things and stereotypes that aren't, aren't good to do. But um, still an interesting film. So I'm still going to make it a recommendation. Okay. Cool. All right. Yeah, I would be interested to go back and check because I think I've I've seen it, but I think I've only seen it once, and I've seen bits and scenes from it. But yeah. Yeah, to see that now would be an interesting thing to go back and see. Well, especially knowing Tarantino, and another reason I went back to watch this is we started talking about our most anticipated film of the year, and mm-hmm. uh, I think we both had Tarantino's film in our list, and right. mine was I think tied for number one. So you definitely hear the Tarantino dialogue. This is like one of I think he had just done Reservoir Dogs. And then he helped provide the screenplay and writing for this film gotcha. before he did Pulp Fiction. Mm-hmm. So it's an interesting time in Tarantino's career to see his words on screen, but not coming from his own camera. So gotcha. um, it's definitely, I think, I think it's a film worth checking out. Just know that it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very typical Tony Scott in the early 90s So for, for what that <laughs> is. Enough. All right. So that is our show for today. Our recommendations. Chris gave the documentary. Tell me again. (laughs) Hill County this morning, this evening. There you go. That's the one. And now I gave. I have to say Mm -hmm. so far, it's not like it just takes place over a day. So I was a little disappointed that that wasn't. The so it doesn't title hold up to the premise of the, uh, the title, <laughs> the thing. title. Oh, that's too bad. So I know, I mean, it does show some mornings and some evenings, but it's not just like one morning and then the evening. So yeah. it's still worth checking out. Good, good, good. All right. Well then, uh, that will be wrapping up our show then. So we did reviews of the wife. We did reviews of shoplifter. We talked about some, uh, uh, science fiction with Dune. We talked about Ghostbusters. We talked about Batman or uh, Bat Hammer, as I should say. Yes, that's Bat actually that would be actually a good title for the film itself. Bat I mean, Hammer. just roll right into it. <laughs> and then our recommendations. So, Chris, people are listening to this. They don't think Bat Hammer will ever catch on, or they are terribly excited for the new Ghostbusters movie. And they want to tell us all about these things. How how would they reach out to us and, and let us know that? And you can also tell me how I'm grossly mistaken about the wife, and it's one of the yeah, best you films you've seen in a long time. Yeah, you could do that as well, sure. Um, so, yeah, send an email to info at themesh.tv and put for candle films in the subject line, and we'll read it and respond to you and let you know our thoughts. And maybe, you know, we can contextualize it and put it on the air. We'll mention it on the air. Also, I have to say, if you are listening to this through something like iTunes, and I mentioned that's one of the ways it's provided. If you do us a favor, you know, we don't charge for the show, but the way you can kind of pay it forward to us is through iTunes, give us a star rating. It helps write a review, give us a star rating, and it helps us reach more listeners. So we'd appreciate that. Very, very true. Thank you. Yes. So we would love to hear from you or, 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 or in any way, shape or form that Chris mentioned those different avenues. And, um, of course, again, mentioning too that, you know, being a podcast, we'd love for you to subscribe to the show if it's something you want to keep getting new episodes downloaded to you automatically. Or you're always welcome to go to themesh.tv, the website where we host all the shows and see all the episodes. And you can play them right there from the website. Very easy and simple to do as well. So that's it for Foot Candle Films for today. We will look forward to talking with you about films and news and recommendations with our next episode. Thanks for listening. See you in the ticket line. Special thanks to Carpal Tuller for the show theme music. For more about Carpal Tuller, visit www.carpaltuller.com. You've been listening to The Mesh, an online media network of shows and programs ranging from business to arts, sports to entertainment, music to community. All programs are available on the website as well as through iTunes and YouTube. Check us out online at themesh.tv. Discover other network shows and give us feedback on what you just heard.